Hey guys, what's up? Hello and welcome to episode 31 of the Forward Progress Football Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Party, and today we're wrapping up the NFC North with our Who Are They series with the Minnesota Vikings. Let's get right on into it. Alright, so before we get on into it, um, first off I hit 50 subscribers and I just want to say thank you. Now, my next goal is going to be 100 by the time the season starts. Right now, only 5% of you guys are subscribed, so we definitely can hit that goal. So help me hit that goal, please. Go hit the subscribe button, leave a like, and comment below if you're on YouTube as well. Help the algorithm push it out to other people. And then also, I'm getting my wisdom teeth taken out on Wednesday. So hopefully, I still get the Friday episode up in time. But if it's delayed by like a day or so, that's what's going on. Um, hopefully, it's no problem, but we'll obviously have to see if I'm able to talk clearly all right and with that stuff out of the way we're going to be finishing off the nfc north with the minnesota vikings starting things off as always with their quarterbacks they have kirk cousins sean mannion kellen mond and nate stanley so cousins has become the definition of a tier three quarterback in my opinion the almost 34 year old has thrown for 4,000 yards and 25 touchdowns every year since becoming the full-time starter back in 2015 while also never throwing more than 13 interceptions. He's an accurate quarterback who will execute the system to the T, but doesn't bring anything crazy like physical ability or much production outside the structure of the offense. However, this offense is definitely set up to succeed with him as the system that new head coach Kevin O'Connell will be implementing is famous for being quarterback friendly and he'll be throwing to one of the best receiving duos in the league. Cousins still needs to prove that he can win big time games and also just avoid disappearing like how he did in week 15 where he threw for 87 yards. Even if he doesn't improve though, it wouldn't be shocking at all to see him finish this year as like a top 5 statistical quarterback. Mannion has been a backup since being taken in the 3rd round in 2015. When on the field though, he hasn't produced much, starting 3 games in his career and having just under 600 yards to go with 1 touchdown and 3 interceptions. This will be Mannion's 4th year with the team and he played for O'Connell before with the Rams, but he doesn't provide a ton of hope if Cousins does end up going down. Mond was taken in the third round last year and attempted three passes, one of which should have been a pick six if it weren't dropped. Many people had him as a sleeper in last year's class, but he couldn't beat out Mannion for the drop last year and it looks to be the case this year again. He may just be a career backup type. And then Stanley was taken in the seventh round 2020, but he hasn't played so far. For running backs, they have Dalvin Cook, Alexander Madison, Kenny Nwengu, Ty Chandler, Brian Kobach, and then CJ Ham and Jake Bargus are fullbacks. If Cook can stay healthy, he's definitely a top 5 back in the league. He has rare explosiveness that helps him hit breakaway runs and is much faster than what his 4 4 9 40 times suggests. And then he also has been a threat in the past game. So I hope that this new offense will definitely tap into that aspect a little bit more even. Madison was taken in the third round of 2019 and has been a pretty good backup for Cook, um, filling in nicely whenever Cook is out with injuries. However, he doesn't do much in the passing game and also hardly sees the field when Cook is healthy. So we'll see if they try to pace Cook a little bit more by giving Madison some more of those snaps as he's proved that he can't handle it with 90 plus yards in three of the four games that Cook mixed last year. And then Nwangu will likely be the backup for Cook after this year when Madison's contract expires. The explosive second year back has shown the traits that you want out of number two or maybe even number one back so far, as he has low 4-3 speed while still being 6-1-2-10. He didn't get many rushing snaps last year, only having 13 carries for 61 yards, but he did have 579 kick return yards and two touchdowns. If he can channel that elusiveness into the backfield, he should make a pretty great one-two punch with Cook. And Chandler was taken in the fifth round out of UNC and provides some good speed as an undersized back, but didn't show too much more than that and is already a 24-year-old as a rookie. And Brian Kobach is a UDFA from this class. 
CJ Ham is a solid overall fullback, a good blocker who can also leak out to catch a couple of passes in space and turn it upfield for a decent gain. And then Barrios has been a backup fullback for the Vikes since going undrafted in 2020, bouncing on and off of their practice squad. And that's really not something you see too often, a team with two fullbacks. I wonder if that was just an old regime thing or if this new coaching staff is going to like that too. All right, so for wide receivers, they have Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen, KJ Osborne, Ola B.C. Johnson, Jalen Naylor, Amir Smith Marset, Albert Wilson, Blake Prohl, Dan Chisina, Tristan Jackson, Myron Mitchell, and Thomas Hennigan. Justin Jefferson has a shot at being crowned the best receiver in the league this year. He has been elite since stepping onto the NFL field, going from a slot receiver who was second fiddle to Jamar Chase at LSU to setting records with over 3,000 yards in his first two seasons. This year, there are rumors of him playing that Cooper Cup role in this offense, as he's physical enough to be that dominant slot blocker and shifty enough to be the best receiver in the league there. With an offense primed to heavily feature the stud receiver, 2,000 yards and or their triple crown is definitely not out of the picture at all. And then Adam Thielen is one of the better number twos in the league, but he is getting up there in age and has struggled with injuries. When he is out there, he's a great route runner and contested catch target who has a nose for the end zone. He also has the physical ability to line up in the slot and be that bully similar to Cup last year, but definitely at a lower level than Cup or Justin Jefferson could do so. And then Osborne was taken in the 5th round of 2020, but only saw special team snaps as a rookie. In year 2, he played good as a slot receiver and replacement on the outside for Thielen, putting up 655 yards and 7 touchdowns. His inside-outside versatility is nice as it allows this offense to deploy its top 3 receivers in any way at once. Um, which we don't always have. We all, a lot of the times have like a designated slot receiver. Johnson had a good rookie season in 2019 for a seventh round pick, putting him 300 yards and three touchdowns, but saw his playing time and production cut in year two, and then missed all of last year with a torn ACL. So he'll need to recover from that and earn a roster spot here in what's forming up to be a pretty deep receiving room. Naylor was taken in the sixth round this year out of Michigan State. Smith Marset was taken in the fifth round last year and saw some snaps, capping it off the season though with a pretty strong performance with three catches, 103 yards, and one touchdown against Chicago. Wilson is a veteran slot receiver who made a nice career for himself since going undrafted in 2014. However, last year was his worst statistical season and he saw his lowest amount of snaps since his rookie season excluding 2018 where he was injured for most of the year and he did also miss a couple games last year with injury. Prohl went undrafted last year and didn't play but couldn't make some noise as a deep threat that's 6-1 with good speed. And then Chestina went undrafted in 2020 and has saw some snaps but not any targets. Um, Jackson went undrafted in 2020 not playing at all yet. Mitchell went undrafted last year and he didn't play, and then Hennigan is a UDFA from this class who is a bit older, but was a really solid receiver at Appalachian State, and I could definitely see him making some noise in a couple years. So for tight ends, they have Irv Smith Jr., Ben Elson, Johnny Munt, Zach Davidson, and Nick Muse. Last year was supposed to be Smith's breakout year with the departure of longtime tight end Kyle Rudolph. However, a torn meniscus t- cost him his season, so now the undersized tight end drafted in the second round 2019 is entering a contract year. Smith is a good athlete who has produced when called upon so far, so let's see if he can be the team's number one so- now. Ellison is a blocking tight end who went undrafted in 2020 with one catch in his career, coming as that rookie. Munt is another primary blocking tight end going undrafted in 2017 and having only 10 career receptions. And Davidson was taken in the 5th last year and didn't see any snaps, and Muse is a 7th round pick out of South Carolina this season. So along their offensive line, they have Christian Derrissaw, Ezra Cleveland, Garrett Bradbury, Jesse Davis, and Brian O'Neill, with Fidarian Lowe, Timon Paris, Olisai Mecca Udo, and 
Blake Brandell backing up at tackle. Chris Reed, Kyle Hinton, Ed Ingram, and Wyatt Davis backing up at guard. And Austin Schlotman and Josh Sokol backing up at center. So Darisaw missed the beginning of his rookie season, but he really started to come into his own toward the end of the year. The first rounder showed off his athleticism that should shine here in this outside zone scheme, and he only allowed more than two pressures once in his final five games, that one game being against Rashawn Gary and the Packers. Then Lowe was taken in the sixth round out of Illinois this season, and Paris was drafted in 2018 but hasn't seen any snaps outside of a few as a rookie. Cleveland was taken in the second round in 2020 out of Boise, where he played tackle. He played guard as a rookie with Reef and O'Neal established there at tackle and ended up staying inside due to the drafting of Darisaw. He's played well there, and with his athleticism, this new scheme could help elevate his game even further as he enters year three. Reed went undrafted in 2015 and played well last year, filling in for injuries along a talented Colts line. He will have a shot at starting at right guard this year, but even if he doesn't, he should provide some stable level play if he needs to come in off the bench. And then Hinton was taken in the 7th round in 2020, but has yet to play. Bradbury has been a very disappointing first round pick. The undersized center prospect was amazing in college, but has struggled against bigger NFL competition. The Vikings declined his 5th year option, so he'll have to take some major strides if he doesn't want this to be his last year as a starter. Schlotman went undrafted in 2018 and has made some spot starts at center for the Broncos, but not really good starts. And then Sokol is a UDFA from this class. Davis went undrafted in 2015 and has seen a lot of starting action for Miami at tackle or guard since 2017. He's played better than most of the rest of Miami's line, but that isn't too much of an accomplishment. Um, maybe kicking back into guard can help him improve even off of last season, but the center right guard combo is definitely not looking that great for Minnesota, while the rest of the offensive line is looking pretty good. Ingram was taken in the second round out of LSU this draft. He has a murky off-field background and didn't show the progression one would expect from someone who started as a true freshman, but he does have a shot to some playing time this season with that shaky right guard situation and the high draft pedigree. And then Davis was taken in the third round last year out of Ohio State, but has struggled with injuries and awareness of the position. He's good in one-on-one -on -one blocking, but has struggled with being in space and picking up stunts, which has him falling out of favor fast with this new coaching staff. O'Neal has quietly risen to one of the best right tackles in the league. He got that recognition last year with a Pro Bowl nod after good development during his four years since being taken in the fourth round in 2018. And then he got a well-deserved contract extension and definitely should be a stud tackle for years with this team. Udo was taken in the sixth round in 2019 and started for the Vikings last year at right guard where he did struggle. Now, being listed at tackle, we'll see if he can still compete for that guard spot or if he'll just be like a band-aid type player plugging in at any holes that may arise. And then Brandel was taken in the 6th round 2020 and was used, to used as a 6th lineman last year in jumbo packages. So along their interior defensive line, they have Dalvin Tomlinson, Harrison Phillips, Armand Watts, James Lynch, Jalen Twyman, Seziato Mewo, TJ Smith, Ty McGill, Jonathan Bullard, Julian Taylor, and Tyree Stevenson. Tomlinson has been a great defensive tackle so far. He's a great run stuffer, eating up blocks at 320 pounds while also being a good enough threat against the pass, getting four sacks in each of these past four years. He played a lot of nose tackle with the Giants, but last year proved that he can excel at a more outside role, playing a lot of three tech. Phillips is coming over from Buffalo, hopefully to replace Sheldon Richardson. He hasn't shown the same pass rushing ability so far in his career, but he'll bring the run defense, maybe even upgrading that matter, and should definitely form a solid duo up there with Tomlinson. And then Watts was taken in the sixth round in 2019 and should provide most of the pass rush juice of these interior linemen. Last year, he broke out for 33 pressures and five sacks, playing from over center all the way to over tackle. 
he'll be playing for a new contract this year, so look for him to potentially truly break out. Lynch was taken in the fourth round 2020, but hasn't really shown much so far. Lynch was taken in the fourth round 2020, but hasn't really shown much so far as an undersized defensive tackle. Twyman was taken in the sixth round last year, but hasn't played yet. Otto Mewo was taken in the fifth this year out of Minnesota. Um, Smith, he went undrafted in 2020 and only has seen a few snaps in one game so far. McGill went undrafted in 2015 and has been a below average rotational lineman throughout his career. Not really doing much of anything when he did see the field last year for these Vikings. And Bullard, he was taken in the third round 2016, bouncing around these past couple seasons and getting a handful of snaps with a few different teams' rotations. Taylor was taken in the seventh round 2018 by the Niners and saw some snaps in his first two seasons, but nothing really since then. And Stevenson is a UDFA from this class. So for edge defenders, they have Daniil Hunter, Zadaria Smith, Patrick Jones II, DJ Wanham, Janarius Robinson, Andre Mintz, Luigi Villain, and Zach McLeod. Daniil Hunter has the physical ability to be the best pass rusher in the league. And his success as a physical beast who didn't produce in college is a big reason why Trayvon Walker was just selected number one overall. However, he has struggled to see the field these past couple of seasons. When out there, he's a game-changing number one, but he needs to stay out there to stay healthy for this team. And then this team is risking a lot by also having Zadaria Smith. If he and Hunter can stay healthy, they are for sure in the discussion for the best duo in the league, but... Smith also is coming off of an injury. Smith can be deployed to rush anywhere and has been successful doing so, quick enough to beat tackles and strong enough to beat guards and centers. This flexibility also allows a third edge to see the field at once, which could be helpful if some of these younger guys can develop. Jones was taken in the third round last year, but disappointed when he was able to get on the field as a rookie. He's got the size and the speed to be a good pass rusher, but needs to add an element of power to his game. In year two, they'll need someone to step up as a third edge, so hopefully he can provide some of that. If not, Wanham started last year after being taken in the fourth round 2020. He wasn't anything crazy, but did decent and posted 42 pressures and 8 sacks. He'll provide at least average level play if Hunter or Smith do miss time with injuries and can be that third edge if Jones doesn't step it up. Robinson was taken in the fourth last year, but missed his rookie season due to injuries. Then Mintz went undrafted last year and saw a few snaps with Denver, not really doing much. Villain and Cloud are UDFAs from this season. So for linebackers, they have Eric Kendricks, Jordan Hicks, Brian Asamoa, Blake Lynch, Chaz Surratt, Troy Dye, Ryan Conley, and William Quenkeu. Kendricks is a top-tier coverage linebacker, but he definitely did have a bit of a down year last year, giving up the most touchdowns in his career. Most of the time, he's an eraser in the middle, even covering Devontae Adams one-on-one -on -one up the seam a couple seasons ago. He's also improved as a run defender, making him one of the best overall linebackers in the league. Hicks is another really good coverage linebacker. He struggled with injuries early in his career, but has remained healthy in Arizona. He's definitely a step down from Kendricks, but he could remind everyone how talented he is now that he doesn't have to be the team's number one linebacker. Asamoa was taken in the third round out of Oklahoma as an undersized athletic linebacker who can perform on special teams while developing as a more all-around linebacker. Lynch went undrafted in 2020, who saw some snaps last year as a third linebacker and will likely fill that role again as Osmo may not be up to snuff as a rookie. And then Strat was taken in the third round last year and is also an undersized athletic linebacker, very similar to Osamoa. The UNC product saw some work at special teams last year, but now we'll probably have to fight to make a roster spot as the Osamoa pick could be signaling that they're already looking to move on. Dye was taken in the 4th round 2020 and played a bit, but not too well as a rookie and then saw even less playing time last year. Connolly was taken in the 5th round by the Giants in 2019, but hasn't played too much yet, and Quen Kayu is a UDFA from this class. 
So for cornerbacks, they have Cameron Dantzler, Patrick Peterson, Chandon Sullivan, Andrew Booth Jr., Caleb Evans, Perry Nickerson, Harrison Hand, Chris Boyd, Nate Hairston, and Ty Smith. Dantzler has been great for a third round pick taken in 2020. The previous regime seemed kind of hesitant to play him, but when he did get out there, he looked like their best corner, giving up 300 yards and two touchdowns and a bit over 400 coverage stops last year. Hopefully this new coaching staff recognizes his talents and allows him to start the whole year. Peterson had a legendary career with Arizona, but is definitely on the downswing now and is entering his age 32 season. He proved last year that he can still play well and should be solid again this year barring any age regression. We see a lot of corners kick inside or to safety once they do get older, so so I wonder if we do see that here to help allow rookie Andrew Booth Jr. to also see the field more. If Peterson doesn't kick inside, we'll likely see a lot of Sullivan there, who has satisfied that role for the rival Packers these past couple of seasons. He's not a great athlete and definitely has his coverage woes, so hopefully he improves or doesn't have to see the field as much as he has in the past couple years. Booth was a first-round talent at corner, taken early in the second this year out of Clemson. He had some injury concern that many people didn't learn about until after he was drafted, and that was like, oh, that's why he fell? But if he can overcome that, he can be a huge steal as a potential number one corner that could be a great duo between him and Dantzler. Evans was taken in the fourth round out of Missouri this year. Nickerson was taken in the sixth round 2018, but has bounced around the league as mostly a special teamer and like an emergency slot guy. Han played a bit as a fifth round rookie in 2020, but hardly saw the field last year. And Boyd was taken in the seventh in 2019 and saw a decent amount of snaps these past two seasons, but hasn't really played too well when on the field. Hairston was taken in the fifth round 2017 and has bounced around as a backup caliber slot option but he did play pretty well for Denver last year. And Smith was taken in the 5th in 2015, not playing too much and hardly seeing the field last year with the Vikings. So for safeties, they have Harrison Smith, Lewis Seen, Cameron Bynum, Josh Metellus, Miles Dorn, and Mike Brown. Smith has been a top-tier safety for the Vikings since being taken in the first round in 2012. He's starting to lose a step and will be 33 now this season, but he will be playing in a quarters-heavy split safety defense that could help play into his strengths as a cover safety. I wouldn't be surprised if he had like a mini career resurgence before retiring. Scene was taken with the last pick in the first round this year out of that legendary Georgia defense. He's another one of these safe safeties, similarly to Adrian Amos on the Packers. Unlike Amos though, he has 437 speed. If he can be as good at reading routes in the NFL as he was in college, He'll definitely have a shot to replace Smith as the outsounding all-around safety for the Vikings for the next 10 years. Bynum played good as a rookie fourth round last year, so I do expect this team to run a lot of three safety looks to get all three of them on the field at once. He didn't see the field a bunch as a rookie, but when he was out there, he was a sure tackler and didn't allow much his way in coverage. And then Medalist was taken in the sixth round in 2020, but hasn't played much so far. Dorn went undrafted in 2020, not seeing the field yet, and Brown is a UDFA from this class. So for special teams, they have Greg Joseph at kicker, Jordan Berry and Ryan Wright competing at punter, and Andrew DePaola at long stopper. Joseph played well last year, hitting 90% of his PATs and 86.8% of his field goals. Berry was Pittsburgh's punter from 2015 until last year, where he spent here in Minnesota. He had a career high in net yardage per punt with over 41, but they do have UDFA right here to compete for the spot. And De Paola has been the long snapper since 2020 here in Minnesota. Alright, so now this is where I get into my whole season projection. We talk about their over-under... and their ceiling, their floor, everything that can really go wrong, everything that can go right, the biggest strength on this team, and the biggest weakness. And then at the very end of this whole series, 
Um, I'm going to be doing a full season projection for the whole NFL where I'll give my official win totals for each team as well as a playoff prediction and a season awards prediction. All right. For the floor of this team, I see them going 7-10. and 10. Um, I think this roster is just too good to really be like a bad team. Um, but some things that can go wrong is Kirk Cousins just having another middling season, showing big games, but also a collapsing a lot when it matters. I think Cook only really has a down year if he isn't healthy. Um, Jefferson, he's going to be absolutely electric no matter what, but maybe he can't just firmly cement himself as top five. And he's like, oh yeah, he's like arguable. And then Thielen looks like age and injuries are catching up to him. Smith either struggles to come back fully healthy or just can't take the reins as a number one in tight end. Um, the interior of this O-line really struggles despite good tackle play. And then the interior defensive line should be fine, but they missed the pass rush juice that Richardson provided. And then Hunter and or Smith might struggle with injuries and the young guys on the edge can't really step it up. Um, these linebackers, they start looking older as they are getting up there in age and the injury bug could get one or both of them again. These corners are fine, but none of them are able to be a true number one. And Smith looks old out there and seeing struggles in his rookie season. And then the floor of this team, I see as being 10 and 7. Um, as I said, like, I don't think this seems necessarily going to be that bad, but I also I feel like they're just going to be like an average team. Like, Minnesota just feels like a very definition of average. And we'll see if this new coaching staff can change that. But for now, especially with Kirk Cousins at the helm, unable to prove otherwise, I'm going to stick to what we've seen in the past. Um, but the things that can go right include Kirk staying consistent and able to show up and elevate the squad to some big-time wins. If Cook's able to stay healthy, he's going to have another amazing season. Jefferson's definitely got a shot to win Triple Crown and be the best receiver in this league. And the land, if he's able to stay healthy and productive, that's a great one too right there. Smith could look great as this team's future tight end. And then Cleveland looks great in year three. So left tackle, left guard, and right tackle are all set. And center and right guard give at least average level play. Watts takes that contract year jump and is a force against the pass in the interior. And the rest of the line rotates well to protect up against the run. Hunter and Smith stay healthy to form one of the league's best edge duos. And the younger edge rushers are productive when they do get out there. Kendricks and Hicks are the best coverage linebacker duo and the solid front allows them to be good enough against the run. Booth and Dancer play great, looking like potential number ones, and Peterson excels at that slot box role. Smith has a career revival in this new system, and Scene comes in and plays great for a rookie. Um, so now we talk about the over-under. It's set at 8.5 wins, and man, I just think that's the perfect reset over under. Like at 8.5, the Vikings are the definition of an average team. I could honestly see them alternating wins and losses every week, like just going through their schedules. Just tell me this doesn't sound like a Viking season. Beat the Packers week one, no Devontae Adams, they're still trying to figure out their identity. And then lose to the Eagles. They beat the Lions lose to the Saints, beat the Bears, lose to the Dolphins, and then lose to the Cardinals, beat the Commanders, lose to the Bills, beat the Cowboys, lose to the Patriots, beat the Jets, lose to the Lions, lose to the Colts, beat the Giants, lose to the Packers, beat the Bears. Like that's just obviously like one or two game streaks in there. But that just sounds like such a Vikings thing to do and just finish like right around 500. A couple of those games like going either way. But if I did have to pick going over or under, I definitely think I would lean under. As I feel like this team will show some hope in year one under the new regime. But there are a lot of young guys mixed in with injury prone players. So it's kind of risky just to project growth from the youth and health from the veterans. The biggest strength on this roster is the receivers. Justin Jefferson's alone make these receivers the biggest strength. 
He single-handedly will win them multiple games this year, and with Thielen and Osborne and then Smith at tight end, this room definitely has some solid potential in this Rams-like system. And then the biggest weakness is injuries. Um, if you think this is a cop-out, then I'd say, okay, the interior of the offensive line is the weakest like position group. But if I'm going to see something that's going to derail their season, it's just how many injury-prone players they have. Um, look across the board. They have Dalvin Cook, Adam Thielen, Irv Smith, Christian Derrisson, Daniil Hunter, Zedaria Smith, Eric Kendricks, Jordan Hicks, Patrick Peterson, Andrew Booth Jr., and Harrison Smith. All of those players have real injury risks, whether they dealt with injuries directly last year or have an injury history. Sure, some of them or all of them could avoid injuries, but if a couple of them miss significant time, then they will miss the playoffs. On the flip side, though, if all of them can't stay healthy, then they definitely do have a shot of snagging a wild card spot. All right, so that's going to do it for today's episode. Um, if you're on YouTube, leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what you think of the Minnesota Vikings. Are they just like the perfectly average team, or do you think they're going to be better or worse than that this year? Um, if you're on Apple or YouTube, what? <laughs> if you're on Apple or Spotify, wherever you might be listening to this, leave a five star review. It really helps push it out. Um, and yeah, we'll see you guys all next time.